The Chinese history can be divided into dynasties. A dynasty is a period of time when China was ruled by emperors from a single imperial family. In the high school world history class, you have probably learned some major dynasties in Chinese history, like Shang, Zhao, Qin, Han, Sui, Tang, Song, Yuan, Ming, and Qing. However, if you take a close look, there are gaps between those dynasties. For example, there is a four-year-long war period between Qin and Han dynasties known as the Chu Han Contention. And there is another 50-year period between Tang and Song, known as the Five Dynasties and Ten Kingdoms period. But most of all, there is a huge gap between the Han and Sui dynasties. Remember, from many high school history textbooks, we learned that the Han dynasty collapsed shortly after the Yellow Turban Uprising in the late 2nd century, and China entered a long period of fragmentation and civil wars, until the Sui dynasty reunified China in 589. But what exactly happened during this chaotic time? Let's go back to the year 184. In this year, the Yellow Turban Army spread out the Han Empire. To suppress the rebellion, local governors enlarged their armies and became self-governing warlords. Although the main force of Yellow Turban was defeated within one year, the central court of Han Dynasty lost its authority over local governments. Regional military forces started to fight against each other, and the young emperor Lu Bian became a puppet of a powerful warlord, Dong Zhou. Soon after that, Dong Zhou took away the crown from Lu Bian and granted it to Bian's younger brother, Lu Xie, who would be known as Emperor Xian, the last emperor of Han Dynasty. Lu Bian was then murdered by Dong Zhou. Because Dong Zhou's rule was tyrannical, he was assassinated by a united force between Han loyalists and Luobu, another warlord. However, neither of them was able to stabilize the situation. Emperor Xian was then controlled by Cao Cao, the warlord based in the Central Plain. Cao Cao was supported by a group of brave generals and military strategists, such as Xia Hao Yuan, Xuan Yu, and Cao Ren, so he quickly rose to power and defeated other powerful warlords like Yuan Shao, Yuan Shu, and Luobu. By the year 205, Cao Cao has generally pacified northern China. In the south, however, two other powerful warlords were still resisting. They were Lu Bei and Suin Xuan. Lu Bei is a distant relative to Emperor Xian. His goal was to restore the authority of Han Dynasty. He was assisted by great warriors like Guan Yong, Zhang Fei, and Zhao Yu, and one of the most talented strategists in Chinese history, Zhu Go Liang, or better known by his courtesy name, Kongming. Suin Xuan was a powerful young warlord ruling the southeastern province of China. He was also assisted by a group of smart people like Zhou Yu and Lu Su, and his defense relied on his powerful fleet in the Yangtze River. When Cao Cao's army marched to the south, Lu Bei and Suin Xuan joined forces in order to survive Cao Cao's conquest. Then, here came the arguably best-known battle in the history of China, the Battle of Red Cliff. This battle has been portrayed by numerous TV dramas, movies, and video games in China, Korea, and Japan. Long story short, Cao Cao was defeated by the alliance between Liu Bei and Suan Xuan and had to retreat to the north. So after this battle, the status of China became very clear. Cao Cao dominated the north, Suan Xuan dominated the southeast, and Lu Bei would soon conquer Sichuan Basin and dominate the southwest. So this basically set up the stage for the Three Kingdoms period. Cao Cao died in the year 220. After his death, his son, Cao Pi, forced Emperor Xian to abdicate from the throne. This marks the end of the Han Dynasty. Then, Cao Pi claimed the throne and established the Wei Kingdom in the north. 
In the following year, Liu Bei established the Shu Han Kingdom in the southwest, and several years later, Suan Xuan also titled himself the emperor and founded the Wu Kingdom. Among these three kingdoms, Wei was the strongest, but it was not strong enough to conquer the other two. Shu Han was the weakest, but it was still capable of launching a full-scale invasion towards Wu Kingdom, as well as several northern expeditions against the Wei Kingdom. The northern expeditions were commanded by Kong Ming. The goal of Shu Han was to capture the Guangzhou region, including the city of Chang'an. The general guarding this region for the Wei Kingdom was Sima Yi. He was the best opponent that Kong Ming ever faced in his career. Taking advantage of the geography and terrain, Sima Yi successfully stopped Kong Ming's attack. Kong Ming died in the year 234, and after his death, the Shu Han kingdom gradually declined due to the mediocre leadership of Lu Shan, the son of Lu Bei. Meanwhile, in the Wei Kingdom, Sima Yi and his sons obtained power and eventually they would be the clan in charge of the Wei Kingdom. In the year of 249, Sima Yi launched a quick rebellion against Cao Cao's descendants and took the Wei Kingdom under his full control. This was known as the Gaoping Ling Incident. In 263, Sima Yi's son invaded the weak Shu Han Kingdom and conquered it. Two years later, Sima Yi's grandson, Sima Yan, overthrew the Wei Kingdom and established his own empire, namely the Jin Dynasty. In 280, the Jin Dynasty conquered the Wu Kingdom and captured southeastern China. China is in one piece again. Now, Jin unified China, it should be a great dynasty, right? Then why it is not usually mentioned in textbooks like other major dynasties? Well, this unification of the Jin dynasty is neither stable nor lasting long. Let's take a closer look. The unification happened in 280, and the Emperor Sima Yan died in 290. That's only 10 years. After the death of Sima Yan, his son Sima Jun became the new emperor, known as Emperor Hui. This Emperor Hui, however, is famous for his low intelligence. He was incapable of ruling such a big empire. Then, the power of the court was in hands of his wife, the Empress Jia Nanban. According to some historians, Jia Nanban was bad-tempered, rude, snaky, and more importantly, ugly. When she controlled the central government, princes and relatives of the Sima clan did not want to submit themselves to the rule of this woman. So they launched a series of rebellions. In 291, Prince of Wu Nan and Prince of Chu were defeated by the Empress Jianfeng. Then more princes rebelled. Empress Jianfeng was killed by Prince of Zhao in the year 300. However, this civil war did not stop here. After killing the Empress, the Prince of Zhao claimed the throne as a new emperor. This annoyed other princes. Princes of Hejian, Chengdu, and Qi began to fight against Prince of Zhao. The Prince of Qi defeated and killed Prince of Zhao in 301, but in the next year, the Prince of Qi himself was killed by Prince of Changsha. At this point, no one could stop the civil war. To obtain more powers, the remaining princes invited some barbarian tribes to join forces with them, so that they could be stronger. In 304, Prince of Changsha was captured by Prince of Donghai. Then, the Emperor sent Prince of Donghai to fight against Prince of Chengdu, but Prince of Donghai was defeated. The Prince of Chengdu entered the capital city and captured Emperor Hui. Then, the Prince of Hejian allied with some local governors and saved the Emperor from the Prince of Chengdu. In 306, the Prince of Donghai defeated the Prince of Hejian, becoming the eventual winner in this civil war. So this chaotic and bloody civil war was known as the Wars of Eight Princes.
After the Prince of Donghai defeated other princes, he murdered Emperor Hui and acclaimed Emperor Hui's younger brother, the new emperor, known as Emperor Huai. At this point, however, the Jin dynasty was already in deep trouble. Barbarian leaders gained power during the civil war and they began to rebel against the Jin dynasty. There were mainly five ethnicities among those barbarians, namely Chungnu, Xiebei, Jiepi, and Chang. In 304, when the civil war was still going on, a group of Di people rebelled in Sichuan Basin and established a barbarian kingdom named Cheng Han. This marks the beginning of the period known as the Sixteen Kingdoms. In the same year, a group of Xunyu people joined the force of the Prince of Chengdu. When the Prince of Chengdu was defeated, the Xunyu leader named Liu Yuan decided to establish his own kingdom. Since his ancestors surrendered to Han Dynasty and was granted the surname of Liu, he considered his kingdom a successor of Han Dynasty, so the name is Han Kingdom. Later, his successor changed the name of this kingdom to Zhao. It is historically known as former Zhao. In 311, the Xunyu kingdom attacked the Jin capital and captured Emperor Huai. This event is known as the Yongjia disaster, and after this, northern China fragmented into pieces. In 318, General Shida rebelled against the former Zhao and established another Zhao kingdom known as the later Zhao. These two Zhaos fought against each other and eventually the later Zhao won the war and became the strongest power in the north. Meanwhile, remnants of Jin dynasty had relocated to southern China and restored their reign in 317. Since then, the Jin dynasty stayed in the Yangtze River Valley. Officials of Jin became corrupted, and the government was controlled by several powerful clans like Wang and She. Although generals like Huang Wen and Su Ti launched several northern expeditions, the Jin dynasty was never able to take back its lost lands in the north. Instead, the south entered a period of fast development. Many well-educated people were disappointed by the Jin government, so they quitted their jobs as governors and became artists, calligraphers, painters, poets, and philosophers. Among them, the most famous ones include Wang Shiji, who is still regarded as the greatest calligrapher in history, and Tao Yuanming, a great pastoral poet of the landscape. The history of the North, on the other hand, is way more complicated. By the year 329, the later Zhao had pretty much unified the north, except for the Liaoning region, which was occupied by Xiebei people, and the Ho Shi Corridor, which was ruled by the former Liang Kingdom. Now, the emperor of later Zhao had to face a difficult challenge, that was how to efficiently rule his land. The founder of later Zhao, Qi Le, was ethnically Jie people. As a minority group, the Jay population was significantly smaller than Han people in his country. Considering this situation, Chile decided to put a harsh rule over the Han people. He installed a racial isolation policy and assigned a corvée to Han people. He believed that as long as Jay rulers kept Han people busy, Han would have no time to rebel. Chile's successor, Chi Hu, was a tyrannical ruler. He even made this policy more strict. The history proved Chile and Chi Hu wrong. Han people lived miserable lives under these senseless harsh rules, so they eventually launched an uprising near the capital city of Later Zhao. The Later Zhao kingdom was overthrown and most Che people in the capital city were killed in Han people's revenge. So now, there is no longer the later Zhao. Some other forces emerged in power. The Xiebei people from Liaoning established the Yan Kingdom, usually known as former Yan, and another group of Di people established the Qin Kingdom in the West, usually known as former Qin. They fought against each other in chaotic wars and eventually former Qin defeated former Yan. 
the former Chin also conquered former Liang in the northwest and again unified the north. The founder of former Qin was Fu Zhen, who was ethnically Di. He learned from the failure of later Zhao and tried a new way to rule the Han people. He showed his respects to well-educated Han people and appointed Han scholars to be his officials and advisors. One of his main advisors, Wang Meng, was ethnically Han. As a result, the Han people were relatively happy in his kingdom and that was why he managed to unify entire North China within a short period of time. In the year 383, Fu Zhen decided to attack the Jin dynasty in the south to completely unify China. He assembled 870,000 troops, while the Jin dynasty only had 80,000. Fu Zhen thought he would win easily. However, he forgot that many of his men were Han people. Although he respected and promoted upper-class Han people, most Han people in ordinary class regarded Jin Dynasty as the true homeland. Also, Chunglu and Chang people in his army did not want to die for him. When the former Qin and Jin armies met each other at the Fei River, Fu Jin's army was badly destroyed. This battle of Fei River totally broke Fu Jin's dream of unifying China. Even worse, he lost his authority in the north. Leaders of other ethnic groups like Xunlu, Xiebei, and Chang began to break away from him. Fu Zhen was murdered in 385. Soon after that, former Qin collapsed, and North China fragmented again. Kingdoms like later Yan, later Qin, Western Qin, and later Liang were established. These kingdoms fought against each other, and some of them even further fragmented into smaller pieces. Those are all among the 16 kingdoms. The last of the 16 kingdoms was the Xia Kingdom, founded by the tyrannical Xunyu king, Holian Bobo. However, none of those small kingdoms would be the eventual winner. The Toba clan of Xiebei people established their own kingdom in 386. They would eventually defeat everyone else in the north and establish the Northern Wei Dynasty in 439. Before that, the Jin Dynasty in the south had been replaced by the Lu Song Dynasty in 420. Therefore, China entered the new period known as the Southern and Northern Dynasties. The history of the Southern Dynasties was still simpler. There were four successive dynasties in the south between 420 and 589. They were Lu Song, Southern Qi, Liang, and Chen. There were good and bad times in the south, but generally speaking, the history of this period is pretty similar to that in the Jin dynasty. The government was controlled by several clans, and officials are corrupted. One new thing is that Buddhism became very popular during the Liang dynasty because the founding emperor of Liang was a disciple of the Buddha. The north was again more complicated and interesting. Since the Northern Way was established by Xiebei, another minority group, the emperors still needed to face the same challenge of how to efficiently rule the empire. But before facing this challenge, Northern Wei needed to firstly deal with another threat. This was the Rurin people from the Mongolian steppe. To prevent Rurin invasions, Northern Wei established six military towns in the far north of the empire. These towns were guarded by Xiebei people from military families. Because they played a big role in the national defense, they were very much respected in the empire, especially by the royal family of the Toba clan. And by the way, the legendary female warrior, Mulan, was based on a military family in one of these towns. In 471, a young new emperor obtained the throne. He was Toba Hong, later known as the Emperor Xia Wen. In 490, after his mother died, he became the true ruler of the empire. Then, he launched a Sinicization reform within the empire in order to turn his empire into a Han-styled empire. 
He also learned how later Chao and former Qin failed. He knew that he could neither suppressing Han people by harsh laws nor paying respect to Han scholars and hoping all Han people become his followers. So his solution was to turn his own Xiebei people into Han people, and that might solve the problem. He encouraged the intermarriage between Han and Xiebei. He forced all of his Xiebei officials to learn the Han Chinese language and use Han-styled names. He changed his own surname Toba into Yuan, which is more Han-style. He also moved the capital city from Pingcheng to Luoyang, which is in the heartland of Han territory. His reform was successful in some ways, and the empire became prosperous for a period. However, after he died, some things went very wrong. After the capital city was relocated to Luoyang, the six military towns became remote places far away from the heartland of the empire. The economy in those towns declined seriously, and people guarding those towns felt that they were betrayed and given up by the emperor. As a result, a massive riot occurred in those towns in 524. Although this riot was quickly put down, the northern Wei dynasty was weakened. To make it worse, a general named Ezhu Rong rose to power during this riot. After defeating rebels, he turned against the central court and killed hundreds of imperial relatives and high-ranked officials by the Yellow River. This tragedy was known as the Ho Yin Massacre. In 534, the Northern Wei dynasty split into two halves, namely Eastern Wei and Western Wei, respectively. Emperors of these two halves were both puppets. The Eastern Wei was controlled by a powerful chancellor named Gao Huang, while the Western Wei was controlled by another powerful official named Yu Wintai. Not long after that, Eastern Wei was overthrown by Gao Wang's son, Gao Yang, who established the Northern Qi dynasty. Gao Yang was ethnically Han, but culturally Xiebei, so he promoted the restoration of Xiebei cultures and lifestyles within his empire. He and his successors were tyrannical and even inhuman. Some best generals of Northern Qi, like the famous Gao Changgong or the Prince of Lanling, were not killed by the enemies but by their own monarch. As a result, the Northern Qi quickly declined in power. On the other side, the Western Wei was replaced by a Northern Zhou dynasty, which was founded by Yu Wintai's son, Yu Wintai. To the opposite of Gao Yang, the Yuan family were ethnically Xiebei, but culturally sinicized and preferred the Han lifestyle. Because of this mixed identity, the Yuan family of Northern Zhou found a new way to rule. They totally ignored the ethnic identity and tried to establish a ruling military group only based on the birthplace. Thus, the Guanlong group was established. People in the Guanlong group might be Han or Xiebei, but they share two things. They were all from northwestern China, and they were all military leaders. Since their social status were based on their contributions in the military, they were widely respected by both Han and Xiebei people in the empire. In this way, the Northern Zhou formed an unbreakable centripetal force and became the strongest empire in China at that time. In 560, the third emperor of Northern Zhou obtained the throne. His name was Yu Wenyong and better known as Emperor Wu of Zhou. He was a brilliant ruler and brought the empire to the heyday. He started Buddhist persecution to force a large number of monks to leave their temples to return to normal lives. In this way, more lands could be cultivated and more soldiers could be drafted. In 577, Northern Zhou launched a full-scale campaign and conquered Northern Qi. At that time, the Sichuan Basin of the Southern Dynasties had already been captured by Northern Zhou. So at this point, Northern Zhou had already owned two-thirds of China. The remaining Chen dynasty in the south was weak. Nobody could stop the reunification at this time. 
Yu and Yong died suddenly in 578 when he was on his way to attack the Turks. His successor was Emperor Jing, who was still a child. In 581, a nobleman from the Guanlong group named Yang Zhen overthrew the Northern Zhou and established the Sui dynasty. This transition of power was very smooth because it is within the Guanlong group. In 589, Sui dynasty defeated the Chen in the south and finally reunified all of China. The Sui dynasty was short-lived, but it set up a very good stage for the Tang dynasty, a third dynasty from the same Guanlong group. There, Chinese history entered a new golden period. And that concludes this video.